So last week, um, the basic point of the first half of last week was, uh, in fact, um, first of all, what is an ensemble? What kind of ensemble can you use uh, for, to describe a, a thermodynamic system in equilibrium? And then what I wanted to do, okay, and so that involved the classical UV theorem. Right? Then I wanted to uh, uh, leverage or continue on from your knowledge of uh, the basic symmetries of the Hamiltonian that you learned in classical mechanics in the QM2 part. Okay? So because you know that, so you may as well actually know that the microcanonical and what's called the canonical ensembles can be derived from the, the symmetries, from just based on symmetry. And so that was the point of the last part of um, last last week before the Gaussian bit. Um, and then there was the uh, quantitative example of the central limit theorem starting from uh, seeing the Gaussian emerging from a binomial distribution. So, so there is, uh, there was the idea of the ensemble, which was here, and the idea of there are accessible regions of the phase space. So, if, for example, if you have a single particle, that's, and this is a this is a free particle uh, in, in fact, it's two 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 particles in one dimension. And they're both free, and they're confined to a box of length L. And this is a this is a classical phase space picture. There is a certain region of phase space that's accessible to them because of the energy constraint. This is the picture for uh, a harmonic oscillator, one harmonic oscillator in one dimension. There's um, x and p, and, um, and so you can just read that. This is straight from Wright, chapter uh, two. And um, I've put in this summary. It should be really clear what we're trying to do here, you know, hopefully in really basic terms. Uh, the next page, there's something that, uh, that it said dp by dt is equal to zero at the very start. Yes, sir. No, no, next page. Okay. Next page. We started off by saying that d p by d t is equal to zero. The the complete derivative. The this one. The yeah. total derivative. Yeah. 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 We started off by saying that in the previous slide we said in the previous paper we said that the partial derivative with respect to t is zero. Right. That's correct. It's in the proof. Right? The p by d, the partial d p by d t. The point of that is this bit here on page eight. Yeah. Okay. So that's it's that 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 is a separate. Yeah. Uh, uh, a separate fact. And then where does the total derivative come from? The d by d t. Also, that comes from yeah. yeah that's continuity. That's that's the that's the theory. Right. right. So I've I've um, put in extra like not put in extra steps. I've just ex uh, noted the questions that you uh, asked, and I've tried to make it as clear as possible. Okay. And. You know, I reckon that I'm really happy with these lecture notes, and I really I welcome feedback. Okay, you read them, you know, when you have time, um, and I but I'd like some feedback to see if, uh, to see what you think, because they're meant to uh, because you've done that bit of classical mechanics, the symmetries the, of the Hamiltonian and constellation laws. Uh, I thought I'd um, I thought I'd just do this last bit. In fact, um, uh, there's this log of the uh, probability of the distribution with a sub subsystem is a constant plus some other constant times the energy. And um, if that beta is constant, then you get the probability distribution equals constant, and that's going to be the um, use that's used, for example, within the microcanonical ensemble. And then, if, but if this first constant is zero and the second one isn't, in fact, it has to be negative then you get the probability is uh, uh, e to the minus beta times e, where um, e is the energy. And that's, that's called the canonical ensemble. 
So basically we derive the canonical ensemble and the microcanonical ensemble just from symmetry principles. And, and the fact that, oh, and a seven basic uh, additive um, quantity, elementary, continu the elementary continuous symmetry operations in three dimensional Euclidean space. It's something I said in last year's QM2 lecture, but it didn't somehow, it just didn't, didn't come into my head during this last week's lecture, uh, during the um, SP2 lecture like last year, but not this year. So there it is, and I've written it there. So there are seven basic things you can do in, in, in three dimensional Euclidean space. You can translate in three dimensions, you can rotate around three angles, or you can time translate. And that's where, that's where these come from. Um, and then the rest is just um, um, just the, the Gaussian. We showed that uh, what what is happening is that even though if for the coin tossing, yeah. if for the coin tossing, what's happening is that uh, even though any particular path is equally likely, uh, the particular the endpoints, some endpoints are far more likely than the others because there are many paths that lead to the, each of these endpoints. They're, they're kind of like the piles up, the number of possible paths to get to the endpoint in some sense piles up. Um, and, and that's turned into a Gaussian as long as you are within, well within n divided by, uh, n times p times q of the, of the center. If you're, if you're within a certain um, distance of the center, well within a certain distance of the center, um, then you have a Gaussian. That's, that's this last bit. Last bit. That's this last bit here. As long as you're well within there at the center, then, um, then it's, it's a Gaussian. And the basic, I basic kind of, if you call it physics or intuition, is that that's because the number of ways of getting to the points near the middle piles up. Okay. So for the first part today, I'm going to continue uh, on that theme. Uh, it's, it's also basically an expression of, um, of um, um, concentration of measure or this high dimensionality effect. Uh, anyway, um, so today's main point is a focus on entropy and in, the, in what's called in the microcanonical ensemble. And so what I mean by that is that we're talking about isolated systems and the energy of the isolated systems fixed. Okay? These are references uh, which uh, I'm not saying you have to read them. Um, but you certainly should start reading Rife, right? because most of the assignment questions are going to be from Rife and and uh, and Callum is Callum. There's no Callum today. And if you want to know more, uh, I strongly suggest you buy Kitel, that book by Kitel. Is that particular book by Kitel, not the famous one? This the book. This particular book is almost unknown. It's a little bit outdated, it doesn't matter, it's great. It's thin and it's got a lot in it. Anyway, so you can read those if you want. Huang is a very mathematical book, but it's, it's, he's a very famous guy as well. It's just a good mechanics. So today, the first thing I'll be doing is uh, entropy and statistical mechanics. <coughs> um, I've done the quick recap already. <coughs> Um, a physical realization of the one-dimensional random walk problem. In fact, the coin tossing problem that we looked at last week is really just a one what's called a one-dimensional random walk. What that really means, and you will see in the assignment, you're going to answer some assignment questions. Okay. Um, uh, we, and it's a weekly interacting spin system. So this is, now we talked about entropy, so I'm applying the idea that we did it for the second half last week to entropy of an isolated system. Okay. The next thing, I want to talk a little bit about time evolution. Now, time evolution means the system is not in equilibrium. Um, so it's really uh, the tendency of an isolated system to settle into an equilibrium. It's 
state, or equilibrium, sorry, thermodynamic equilibrium. And in there, um, I'll look at in, fair, intuitively, a lot very intuitively, but also a little bit quantitatively, uh, how a, a non-equilibrium ensemble, which means a non-equilibrium initial distribution, uh, evolves uh, to equilibrium. And that's called, uh, there's a very good example, a very good theorem uh, that Boltzmann came up with called the H theorem, um, which uh, is a little bit controversial. Um, um, yeah, I don't want to go very deeply into it, but the, the theorem itself is fascinating and it's really worth looking at, and I think it's something that uh, is very well worth knowing. And then 2.2 is something that really you've got to know, and it involves what's called the method of Lagrange, Lagrange multipliers, something that you, you, must, you must know in an undergraduate physics degree, I think. Um, and we'll, the, the, what we're doing is we're going to find, uh, out of all the prob possible probability distributions, um, you think of any probability distribution for a system uh, that's isolated, um, what is the maximum number of permutations uh, given that probability distribution? Now, what, does that, what that means is uh, it will be clear when we actually do it. So but by maximum the no, maximize the number of permutations given that, that, that some systems in the ensemble are in this state, some in this state, some in this state, if you maximize the number, in fact, what you get is the equilibrium distribution under those conditions. That's a really, really powerful uh, method that's used to derive new theories of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, uh, especially in, some, in a research field that's very popular at the moment in, for example, our lab. Um, it, um, colloidal systems, systems uh, of, of molecules in solution, uh, kind of chemical physics sort of thing. A lot of uh, the, the groundbreaking for the, the initial papers in that uh, were, you, were deriving the statistical mechanics, the probability distributions, using uh, this method uh, in 2.2. Right? Um, so Terrell, Terrell Hill was the guy who did a lot of the groundwork in that in the, I think the 60s or, 60s or something. Um, he was a professor of chemistry. Um, Obviously, he understood physics very well and statistical mechanics very well. So um, that's a very useful, very useful method. So, professor, is that like maximizing entropy? Um, in, in, in fact, yeah, yeah. Um, this method works in 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 any situation. In a, we're here. We're looking at it for an isolated system, and in fact. It's, it's trivial, you can do it by inspection, but I'll, I'll work through the mechanics of it just to show you how, how it goes. When you stare at it afterwards, you will realize that you can do it by inspection for this particular system. Uh, later, uh, we'll do it for um, what's called the canonical ensemble for a system in contact with a heat reservoir. And after that, we do it again uh, for a system in contact with a heat reservoir and particle reservoir. And this, this method is really powerful. So you're essentially optimizing, finding the probability distribution that's optimal. Yeah. And the last thing is the connection with thermodynamics. So we're just working out the conditions for equilibrium. That's what you mean the probability distribution, you mean of the system is not on. Yeah. A feature that I've introduced um, in fact, with uh, lecture nine, the new the new edition of lecture nine is this one. It's the minimum knowledge uh, for each lecture, and uh, it's the parts that uh, if you you know you really should um, nail it down first uh, if you want to really understand the stuff. So SP two tutorial sheet questions as well. Uh, I haven't done SP two tutorial sheet five, so um, I haven't I can't write down the questions here yet, but. Uh, if you look at this, you can see what the most important parts are, especially if, you're, if you want to just, uh, you know, just pass the course or get a B or something. If you want to really, really understand this and try to get into 
uh, Stanford University or something, then you've really got to understand this thoroughly, the whole thing thoroughly. Yeah. But if you just want to, um, you know, um, if you just want to pass, and uh, then that's that's fine too. But this is this is the minimum. Like, that's, that's a new feature. All right, so let's begin. Um, so we have entropy in statistical mechanics. Well, first of all, in thermodynamics, uh, we learned that entropy of an isolated system has the following properties. So ds is an exact differential, and it's uh, dq, and this should be you know, like a straight d like this, but I don't have the font in my, um, in my software to do that. I don't, I don't use LaTeX to do this. Um, so this is this this bent D is meant to be the straight D like that. So DS is DQ or D for a reversible process. It's, yeah, it's an equality sign only for a reversible process, otherwise it's greater. Entropy is additive over weakly interacting subsystems, and uh, any, in any spontaneous process, the entropy must increase. The total entropy must increase or stay the same. Right. So yeah. Shouldn't it be quasi-static? Yeah. yeah, that's right, yeah, quasi-static. But <laughs> reversible would be zero, right? Yeah, the For reversible process, yes, zero. Um, um, not, not if, uh, not if you have two systems in, <coughs> yeah, the isolated system here, you got, uh, Cold object and a hot object, and they, and they So is it just of, so it's not it's not the total entropy, the S, the DS that's mentioned. Is the S for the total entropy or for just one object? Oh, it's the total entropy. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's not a reversible. It's not a reversible. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Press steady. No, I've got to just go. I can't think at the moment. I need more coffee. Um, I'll, I'll look into that. Um, we argue, now I'm going to write, instead of writing S on K everywhere, uh, that's S on K is dimensionless, I'm going to call that sigma. So sigma is going to be a dimensionless entropy. And I think, I think it's more natural to, to use dimensionless units because really all you're doing is counting, counting the accessible states and just taking the log of it. So, the natural, I think the most natural way to write it is in dimensionless form, sigma. So this is an isolated system in equilibrium, so you've got to make sure it's both isolated and in equilibrium. Okay? Uh, in classical, me classical mechanics, um, you would start off by saying that it's the log of the accessible volume in phase space. The accessible volume, um, phase space volume is traditionally um, denoted gamma, and phase space is, is uh, often called gamma space, and as a like a, a like a, a subset of the volume, you the, like the standard notation in a lot of books is delta gamma. So that's just, that just means a a, a, um, a volume a volume in phase space that's accessible to the particle or, or the system, given that it has a certain energy okay, within a certain small range. Um, and as I argued last week, to make the actual phase space accessible volume dimensionless, you divide it by um, some constant to the power of 3n, where the constant h naturally has the dimensions of momentum times length, which is, uh, say, joule seconds, dimensions type, uh, momentum type times length. That also, that also d dividing by small uh, um, cells, it's got a cell um, um, like this. Also, discretizes this, this volume delta delta gamma, makes it discrete and countable. Um, now, any of the above expressions for the dimensionless entropy show that for any thermodynamic state E V N, uh, the entropy is a d definite number, independent of how the system arrived at the particular energy uh, state EVM. Okay? Now it's a definite number and it doesn't matter, it has no memory. 
Uh, so it's a, it's a, that means that infinitesimal change in sigma must be an, an exact differential. An exact differential means it doesn't matter the path that you took to get there. There's no memory. Okay. So um, and so that basically takes care of the first bit. The second bit is uh, entropy is additive of the weakly interacting subsystems, but that's just the property of the log function. Okay. As long as, um, as long as, um, well, the thing is that the size, the, the accessible volume of, if you have one one subspace uh, with this number of accessible cells, if you like, volume counted in, in these cells, and another one, delta gamma two, this number of another system like this, and if and if um, combining the two systems does not uh, stop um, the particles of one system from occupying um, the cells that it used to occupy. You know, it does, there's no sort of blocking or or attract or what's some sort of interaction. Then, then, then the total is just the product delta gamma over h on three n. It's a product. The total accessible for the combined system is the product of the accessible number in these two. That's just not, you know, and you've got to get this intuition that, in fact, they're weakly interacting, so one is not kind of blocking the other in any way or making it, um, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, so just given this, it's a very, uh, very basic uh, fact, you can already uh, tell this. Um, the volume of an ideal gas is doubled uh, while the number of particles and energy are held fixed, what is the change in entropy? Okay. Well, the change in entropy, the entropy, uh, first of all, you need the, uh, uh, the accessible volumes of phase space. And the only thing that's changing is the, the, vo uh, the position part of the phase space, not the momentum part, because the energy, the, to the total accessible energy is the same. So the momentum part is the same, but the volume increases by two. So the, the phase space volume that's accessible afterwards, um, the, the ratio of that compared to the initial accessible volume is, well, the, the, the volume initially is, uh, finally is the final volume power of n. The initial, the, the phase space volume is the uh, volume of the container to the power of n initially, right? So V is the volume of the container and V to the N is the volume accessible in phase space, um, or, or in the spatial part of phase space without the momentum part. Mm -hmm. They're both the same. Uh, so I don't, the V that we are looking at right now, mm -hmm. that's the spatial, just normal spatial. Yeah, it's like the, the volume of the container. And yeah. why is it to the power of N? Because each particle um, occupies a region in phase space that has... Uh, in phase is two n dimensional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two n dimensional. So, so, yeah, okay. so for example, um, here you have two particles. Yeah. Here is two particles, and the, the, here is the, the space part of the of the uh, of the phase space, and here is the uh, momentum part of the phase space. And this is for uh, two free particles in one dimension, and so the volume uh, is L squared, where the volume of the container is L L squared for two particles. So both particles, so n for n particles in the other case, um, this part um, is, is what changes. And this part stays the same of the phase space. So this part cancels out. And so you have um, basically two to the n for the ratio of phase space volumes. But how do we know that uh, it's just like this ratio is exactly the same as this ratio? Or is it like oh, because uh, a free, an ideal gas is free particles. That's what an ideal gas is. And so, you know, the, so the, the change in entropy is the final entropy, take the initial entropy, is this is dimensionless. And so that's just n log 2. Um, okay, so this is just the recap of last lecture, which I've already done. The basic point being, as I said, that even though the probability of any part is one over two to the n, 
is exactly the same. Uh, the probability of ending up in these middle states is, is far higher than ending up at one of the edge states out uh, here. Um, because the number of paths sort of piles up in the middle, in, to, in, in the center. And the central limit theorem, that's where the center comes from, the word central limit theorem. Um, the, the, the sum of, uh, so, so that, that's just, this, yeah. Okay, um, but now I want to just do a physical realization of this and extend this idea to entropy or, or apply it to, uh, to entropy. And so what we do is consider uh, n uh, non-interacting particles um, and they each have a magnetic moment mu. A magnetic moment means they're like a bar magnet and this particular uh, magnetic moment uh, is constrained to be either up or down. Uh, maybe because of the, the crystal structure of the material or, or whatever. Um, but uh, if you apply an external magnetic field, which we um, denote as H, then uh, the energy uh, will the energy of the um, of the each particular magnetic moment um, can be if it's if if that's if that's the direction of the magnetic field, um, then if it's parallel, then that's the lowest energy because the magnetic moment tries to align itself with the external magnetic field. If you do work on the on the magnetic moment and turn it around, you are doing work. So its energy here is greater than the energy if it was in the ground state like that. Right? So um, so the energy uh, when the the magnetic moment is parallel to the external field is lower than the energy when it's anti-parallel. So the lower energy, uh, lower energy state is minus mu h and the higher energy state is plus mu h. Okay. Um, so parallel is lower. What we want is to calculate the probability distribution of the total magnetic moment, M. Now the total magnetic moment um, is the, it is, uh, okay, when, when the field is switched off. Um, and the, the particles are still constrained to be either up or down, but when you f switch the field off, what happens, you get, you get some random, random distribution of, of spins point of, another way of, Say so magnetic moment is a spin. Spins pointing up or down. You know, I'm going to use the word spin. Um, because the field is zero, you see, if, if you switch the field off, then you would expect uh, these the, to be no particular bias in any direction. If you switch the field on, then the magnetic field is is so this one here, for example. Uh, if, if the field is that way. This one here is at a higher energy, and a system would naturally want to uh, go to a lower energy, and this one would want to naturally turn that way and point parallel to the external field. So if you switch that on, um, it would be like this. But when you switch that off, uh, then see what's happening, you not only have the spins, these spins are actually, these magnetic moments are um, due to unpaired electrons in uh, in some molecules in some solid and that's at some temperature what's happening is the molecules in the in the solid are colliding because of thermal agitation they're colliding like this and that's bumping the uh, the, the the magnetic moments causing them to, to randomize like this so thermal agitation at a finite temperature T causes randomization of the orientation of the spins in the absence of, a, of a, in fact it always tries to do that whether there's a magnetic field there or not it's just that sometimes the magnetic field wins if the magnetic field strong enough it wins so, but the, the one the case in which it's anti-parallel yeah it's it's an unstable equilibrium right so is are we considering the case in which thermal agitation or the agitation of the matter is precise that it just aligns the... Um, it's kind of a... Um, it, it's, 
it, it, they're kind of like to to it's like a a, a volume knob that that clicks. It either clicks there or clicks there. And oh. and and if if you have a a, a, a magnetic moment in the lower state mm -hmm. and it gets hit by a molecule here, the molecule the collision might transfer enough energy uh, to, to flip it to the other side where it stays there because it can't it sort of can't go anywhere um, um, naturally without being um, hit again. So, so if the energy is larger, it still remains in that fixed position. That's the case that we can see. Yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of basically the picture is that these are just randomized because of the positions, because of the collisions. Yeah. Um, so because the, the number of spins pointing up, you, you expect that in the absence of the magnetic field that uh, the number of spins pointing up and the number of spins pointing down should be the same. But what you don't know is where they're going to be. You know? So the same energy, so the same magnetization, you expect zero magnetization. The same magnetization has many possible um, um, permutations of, of, of up and down as long as you have the same number up as down, yeah. okay? Um, but, in, so, but in general, first of all, we want to um, uh, work out the probability distribution for M. Now, just because uh, on average, we would expect an equal number to be up or down, that's what we expect on average. But if you actually observe any, at any particular time, you're not gonna actually see the, 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 the an equal number of spins up and spin down, you're gonna you're gonna see some that might be maybe even so a few spin few more up than down, um, or if you if it's a very lucky day, you might see many more up than down, or even all up and down if it's like once in, once in the age of the universe or something, right? So so there are so in fact in any particular observation. Uh, you can see an entire distribution of, of magnetic moments, right? but but you expect them to be uh, the mean to be zero. Over many observations, the average is going to be zero. It's a random variable, okay? and so we want to find the distribution. The number of magnetic moments that that are up are um, you, you can think about this for yourself later. It's n plus now, the magnetic moment is n times mu. Now, this n is the is the <coughs> net number uh, that's that's pointing up. This that n there is um, now n plus n on little n on two is a number pointing up, and n minus n on two is a number pointing down. And if you the net number pointing up. The, uh, the 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 number pointing up minus the po number pointing down equals n. Okay. So this is the number pointing up. This is the number pointing down, and n is the like the excess um, that are pointing up. Right. So n times mu is the magnetization. Okay. Um, right. Now, any now any particular sequence, uh, in fact, um, any particular sequence, if there's no bias, any particular sequence of up and down is equally probable. It's, there's no, you know, it, it's just you have um, two possibilities for the first one, times two possibilities for the second one. Two possibilities for the third one, and there are and there are n spins, n magnetic moments. So that's n times. So that's two to the n. Okay. So the each of, and each of them are equally probable. So that's the probability is one over two to the n. So that's that. However, um, if you ask for a specific magnetic moment, the specific magnetic moment. Is uh, is the net number um, is, is 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 depend depends on n, 
The specific magnetic moment is n mu, and it depends on the diff on this difference. Okay, and and that difference is um, that the, the, the probability of having um, um, this number pointing up and this number pointing down, not the probability, the, the, the number of ways that you can have given a particular n here, given a particular n, the number of ways of having um, that number pointing up, or sorry, this number pointing up, this number pointing down, is this um, is, is um, n choose uh, n plus n on <coughs> two? I think that works. Out. Anyway, it, it, it's that. Both of them. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, n, n n choose n on two. Uh, n plus two. Uh, I, uh, I don't. I don't want to think. It, it's that. Right. So. So even though each sequence is equally probable, if you ask for a particular magnetic moment, uh, suddenly many sequences can have the same magnetic moment. So the probability of having that magnetic moment is this multiplied by the, prob the, the probability of each sequence, because you've got that many sequences. Okay? So that's one over two to the n times this combinatorial factor. And now, um, uh, so that's the probability. Now what you do is you use Stirling's approximation. And this is Stirling's approximation. This is the real deal. Okay? It's got this 2 pi factor there. Okay? And, um, and then you just consider, you know, we, we're interested in the zero field case. And we want to know when uh, the, 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 the part, the um, what the probability distribution looks like when uh, the, the number of up spins is almost the same as the number of down spins. So in other words, n is a very small number. It's, it's, it's got to be close to zero. And what I should do is absolute value of n there. It's got to be n is close to zero. In other words, the number of up spins and the number of down spins is almost exactly the same. We were interested in, because we're expecting that in zero field, the, the, the distribution is probably going to be maximum around there. Right? So we're looking around the maximum. So um, just n is going to be a little n is going to be a very small number compared to n. And then you just work it out. You just work out what the factorials are, and you get that the probability um, of having uh, this excess of n little n spins is this Gaussian distribution. And it's a normalized Gaussian distribution that you can check. Okay. Um, if you had not used uh, this, uh, the proper Stirling's approximation, then you would not have a properly normalized Gaussian distribution. So, what's happened is that, okay, so, so that's that. So you get this Gaussian coming out of it. So the magnetization. Um, so m equals little n times mu um, is also a Gaussian um, and um, is centered at zero and the most probable value coincide, coincides with the mean values. The most probable value here is obviously n equals zero. That's the maximum. Um, and that's also the mean value as you can read from, um, from the um, definition of the Gaussian. Okay, the width of the distribution is uh, is um, uh, approximately uh, n, the square root of n, and the relative width is 1 over square root of n. Now, now this is where it really gets interesting. Okay, so for, so again, so again we've, we've, we've um, derived, we've found a, a Gaussian distribution. <laughs> now where it really gets interesting is this. So let's calculate the entropy of this um, of this <coughs> system, and so we need to calculate a volume in phase space. But all we've got is a discrete number. Uh, we've just counted the number of states. So uh, just a, a very reasonable approximation or uh, assumption, very reasonable assumption, is to say that each 
um, a possible arrangement of spins occupies a unit volume of phase space. It's what we did in, in the quantum statistical mechanics, or the, the, the semi-quantum, semi-classical um, analysis in lecture eight. But why do we need to do that? It doesn't become immediately from the definition as they um, could be in a number of ways? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just that, um, yeah, sure, right. You, you can either say, oh, well, the definition is just a number of ways, um, or you can say, well, I'm going to relate it back to a volume in phase space, right? Um, in, in quantum statistical mechanics, it's the, it, there's exactly one unit of phase space for every possible arrangement. That's because of the discrete nature of X and P, in, uh, or of P in the you know, particle in a box. Um, but in classical mechanics, um, um, it, has, it, it can be any number, as because as long as you're interested in the difference of entropies, not an absolute value, not an absolute entropy. In quantum statistical mechanics, you get in, uh, in classical statistical mechanics, there's always one free parameter, which is this H number, which discretizes phase space. In quantum statistical mechanics, it's nailed down as Planck's constant. So yeah, it's fixed. So there's no arbitrariness. But we'll, we'll get to that um, um, much later. So we don't know the H for this one? Um, we don't care. No, we don't care because we know a number of permutations or arrangements. We say each, each arrangement has a unit volume in phase space. Okay. Um, you know, the number of sequences with zero magnetic moment is you just put zero <coughs> into the into the um, the combinatorial factor, so you go this n factorial over n on two factorial squared, and then uh, just using the um, the Stirling's approximation again, um, you, you take the you take the log of this, and the entropy is just the log of this, and it's uh, asymptotic to uh, n log two minus half log pi on 2 times n. Okay? Okay. Now, this is the entropy, um, you know, the number of particles is obviously large, and this is the entropy of, um, of the case where, um, where of, 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 the, of just the sequences of zero mechanic moment. Um, now the thing is, if n is large enough, notice that this is essentially log n here, but this is a linear term in n. This is, this is actually huge compared to that. So that, pro that entropy there is essentially n log 2. But this n log 2 is in fact the entropy you would get if all to the n permutations were equally probable and, e and regardless of total angular momentum. Okay. That's what I mean. So if you would get regardless of total, the total, so uh, we would get if we disregarded that's what I mean. It's a better way to put it. Disregard of the total angular momentum. <clears throat> this is the entropy of the sequences with just magnet uh, magnetization zero. So you just picked out the, the center of the distribution. And here, this is this is what that number tends to, you know, n doesn't have to be very large, n can be like a hundred, it's already pretty well there. Is that but that is the same entropy you would get if you ignored the magnetic moment and just had all possible magnetic moments. Okay. So what that is saying <coughs> is that for the purpose of calculating entropy and many other thermodynamic quantities, no significant error is made if you say that <coughs> All of the accessible phase space has the property of the most probable um, condition of the system. This, 
here you are picking out only the um, the most probable, most probable ones. Yeah. And if you say, oh well, no, as an approximation, I will just assume that the entire accessible face space, um, um, I'll find the entropy of the entire accessible face space. It, there's almost no error. So for in large enough. The term on the right is the correction term. Is it like a first correction term, right? Exactly. And yeah. and that's the total number of permutations, and that's the one for the most probable. That's the correction yeah. for the most yeah. probable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're 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 subtracting. You no, know, in fact, you're subtracting away the the others. Right? Yeah. Around the tables. Yeah. 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 So. Um, so you may as well say that all the systems in the microcanonical ensemble are in the same are in the same um, um, state. Isn't quite the word. Um, same um, condition. There, there's, a, there's a zero magnetic moment. There's a condition that uh, external parameter. Okay. I don't understand why you say that they're equally probable. Oh, I don't, that's why I crossed it out. Yeah. They're equally probable when you're in. So we're, we're just disregarding the fact that... Just disregard it. Yeah. We're disregarding the fact that we can't have uh, huge deviations from the mean if we if we have large n. That basically we can't have one, 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 or head, 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 head. It's just all of the, all of the possible all of the possible permutations without any question. If we have lord and lord. Yeah. Basically, uh, it doesn't matter if you include one 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 in your in your face space. Because the entropy doesn't change. Because the entropy doesn't change. You may as well say all the uh, states, uh, all the states are um, accessible. Uh, all these states um, have the same magnetization. Um, and how does this relate to the accessible phase space? Uh, uh, basically, this is the entropy of the entire accessible phase space. So that's that's a lot more. That's that's the magnetization of all the states, uh, yeah. all, all possible magnetic moments, total magnetic moments, rather than just the one in the middle. Just so like the entire phase space is sort of compressed into the mean, into the, into the mean. Yeah. yeah, which is the kind of mind-bending concept. Yeah. Anyway, um, so for a large enough number of particles, large enough n, whatever. Any uh, particles are. The entropy is insensitive to the price, precise specification of the condition of the system. It can be zero magnetic moment or any magnetic moment you want in the neighborhood of the most probable condition. Um, you know, in view of this, in fact, there's another uh, important uh, assumption in statistical mechanics, and that's a postulate that equilibrium. Uh, that um, the maximum of the distribution in the, at equilibrium, the maximum of the distribution always coincides with the mean. So from what we've done so far, you've got no reason to doubt that. Uh, in fact, it breaks down, but we'll see in SP3 next semester. It works, um, it, it works, um, it's a very, it's, you know, it works almost all the time, except in phase transitions. <coughs> in, except um, in some phase transitions, even in some phase transitions, it still works. Okay, so that's, that's that. So next point is time evolution and tendency of an isolated system to settle into equilibrium. So now, now we're not talking about equilibrium statistical mechanics. The system can be far away from equilibrium. Uh, so, you know, what could that be? <coughs> um, well, let's see. We could talk about the uh,
coin toss, in terms of the coin toss sequences, there are two to the end sequences. We can label each sequence by an integer. Um, so one, two, or all the way up to two to the n. And so the R equals one, let's just say it's H, 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 H. I equals two is all H's except the last T. Um, R equals K is some T1, T2, T3, up to Tn. Some, and each of these can be, um, T is a toss one, T2 is toss two, toss N. <coughs> okay. Um, now what if you have a nu random number generator and the random number generator just selects an integer uh, from this set here, just randomly with uniform probability distribution. In other words, any one of these e are equally probable. So you select an integer uh, out of those with probability 1 over 2 to the n. Okay, each of those is 1 over 2 to the n. Sum over all the probabilities, there are 2 to the n um, states and um, and each is probability 1 over 2 to the n, so the total is 1, so it's normalized. Um, do this many times, this curly n, and make sure that this, this number of times is much, much bigger than, uh, than the number of states in here, so that averages and things like that make sense, statistics make sense. Since the number of accessible states is finite, uh, the sequences will be selected multiple times, and for this curly n sufficiently large, each state R will be selected an equal number of times. Um, therefore, um, you could say that this system, in some sense, spends an average, on average, an equal amount of time <coughs> in each state. Now, each state R represents an entire sequence of coin tosses, and any sequence is equally likely, but an overwhelmingly number of sequences will have half heads and half tails. Uh, which, which is saying that for large curly n, large number of um, experiments if you like, um, this system spends an overwhelmingly <coughs> most amount of time in states with the number of heads equals n on 2. That's approximate. Um, approximately n on 2. It's so close that it's like e to the minus a yeah. thousand. Yeah. Or e to the minus ten to the twenty something. Yeah. Okay. It's cool, yeah. Uh, now, forget about this page, it's not really that important, but what I what I want to get at is that imagine you've got some contraption, um, some some way of you've got a cup or some container or something and you've got a coin. And, then, and you're, you're able to flip this coin sort of automatically. This whole system um, can can flip coins automatically um, in some way. It's not not very important um, what the mechanism is. Um, each what I'm saying is that each time sequence can be mapped into like a spatial orientation, like a, a single system with the same. Uh, <coughs> um, uh, you have um, some number of uh, states here. Um, it's the name same number, so, not so, same, some number of cups here, um, some number, which is equals the number of tosses here. So it's a very large thing, and so uh, a single sequence here correspond uh, in time corresponds to uh, a single arrangement of this in space. So does, do you get the picture? Ensemble. Yeah, it's an ensemble, right? Yeah. Right. Physical realization is just um, the uh, magnetic dipoles um, that I was just talking about in that crystal. Okay, so it's actually actually a physical thing. So here is the ensemble. Um, if I if I let this on, uh, let the ensemble evolve, each, each of these is isolated from each other. They don't interact. Um, and if you take a snapshot of the entire ensemble, you would count a certain number of these in state number one, a certain number in state number two, a certain number in, in state uh, two to the n minus three or something, in state number three, whatever, and you get some distribution at any time. You count the number of systems in the ensemble that are in, in each state. So the number of systems in state one is zero, 
number of systems in state three, so y, state five is one or whatever. Number of systems in, in state two to the n is say zero. Okay, these are called occupation numbers. An occupation number is the number of states in the ensemble um, with the, the, that that the number of systems in the ensemble that are in a particular state. Okay, so. And as the total number of systems in the ensemble becomes extremely large, uh, then um, the occupation number divided by the number of systems in the ensemble tends to the uh, probability. And if the system is in equilibrium, um, then it would be one over two to the n the probability. Okay, that's just a, a basic introduction. Look, yeah. If the system, as long as there is a be in equilibrium right? Um, if the movement phase is so. as in, if it's in equilibrium, then it be in the center, in the half half, right? Ah, um, uh, no, because any of these is equally likely. Any any state, well, what's a state? Um, a state is essentially. A sequence, head, head, tail, head, tail, head, 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 tail. Each of those is equally likely. Uh, what does it mean to be in equilibrium when we're talking about time evolution? Okay. We don't normally talk about time evolution because we're normally talking about an equilibrium situation. In, an, in thermodynamic equilibrium, there is no net time evolution. Nothing happens in time. Okay. But um, what we've done is constructed a system where each state is equally likely at any instant t because states are drawn from a random probability uniform random probability distribution and, and it's true for all t so even though every state changes so from one state from one state uh, time to another so you've, you've got some arrangement say particular cup, it's a heads. Um, in the next time step, uh, after the collisions, um, this could be a tail. So in fact, the, the states move around the face, the face space, but the proportion um, in each state remains the same. So what that is saying is that the number of systems in the ensemble that leave any particular state per unit time must equal the number that enter that particular state at a, at a time. So it's just like the continuity you did in the previous slide. Exactly. This is, this is the continuity uh, equation in a discrete uh, sense, right? But the, the continuity, that's a really interesting thing that you said, because this here is called the principle of detailed balance. Okay? And that's, that's a, um, way back in, I think, 80, the 1870s when Boltzmann first came, came up with this stuff. Um, it's it's a it's a balance. It's called detailed balance because it's not only an overall balance where the uh, the, the the overall distribution doesn't change. It's detailed in the sense that if you look at uh, the microscopic detail, the states, right. it's balanced. The number coming in equals the number coming out, and that's what equilibrium is. And equilibrium, if you're looking at like, the time evolution stuff uh, level or point of view, it's, it's exactly this. And it's true for every state. And so overall, the, system, the, the, the system, system's thermodynamic properties are not changing. Okay, the macroscopic properties. Okay? Now, so equilibrium, the occupation numbers are time independent for all states. Um, now, oh, so why do all the systems in the ensemble, now we're talking about an isolated system, and I, I have to emphasize again that this is an isolated system or the micro-canonical ensemble, right? Micro-canonical, I said micro-canonical right at the, on, the, on the cover page, but I'll just say it again, okay? Isolated system, no energy. Um, why do systems in the ensemble want to occupy each state equally? Why do systems tend to equilibrium? If we prepare an ensemble with some states missing, 
Will those states stay missing? Why or why not? Yeah. What do you mean by we prefer in a way that, that, that it's missing? Isn't it that we provide like the physical condition? Suppose we're able. Suppose we're able to um, to actually prepare the ensemble in any way we want, and say, okay, I'm going to leave out states um, where um, I'm, I'm not going to have any states with a combination um, th h h t somewhere in there. Get to do a random string string generator, and 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 just filter out all all. Um, all sequences and substrings that, that have that. And then you say, then after, the, that's the starting point, and then um, and then what you're going to do, these are like coins, and, and at any point, each one of these has a probability to split. You get the, you get the idea, you get the feeling? So, so you start off with some, 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 some set of um, strings, that's your ensemble, there are many systems, and then each each member of the ensemble you allow to evolve in time, yeah. and then um, and then what that means is that in this case is that each each um, entry here, if you whatever you want to call it, uh, has a probability from one time step to the next to flip or stay the same. Yeah. So that can flip, that can stay the same, that can flip, that can stay the same. It's like starting off with just one. Okay, yeah. Or you can start off with just H, 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 H. Yeah. If I start off with H, 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 in the next time step, what's going to happen? They all run the ways. So, what I mean by starting off with this state is that every system in the ensemble starts off, with the fixed starts off exactly in exactly the same state. Oh, I see. That's, that's, so, what I'm saying is that I'm, I'm preparing many, a no, very large number of initial strings um, in that state, and then and then I let that evolve like now. So what did we filter out then? Oh, in that case, you filtered everything that does yes. not have nature. Everything, all, everything other than this yeah. particular one. Yeah. So 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 in other words, I've got it here. Oh yeah, great, excellent. So for example, in fact, there's the other. There, there it is. So for example. Um, if I have a probability distribution, um, if, if I prepare an ensemble that looks like this, all heads, um, I would go, say, probability distribution uh, for state number 2 to the n, 0. All of these, 0, but state number 1, probability 1. Because all the systems in the ensemble are all heads. So this is, this prob this, um, this is extremely concentrated, the probability distribution is extremely concentrated in one state. And the question is, how will that, how will that evolve? Obviously, pretty clearly, yeah. you see it. That, see that one has a 50-50 chance of ending up tails. Yeah. Same as that, same as that, same as that, same as that. So, it's the same as so in the very next really step, <laughs> yeah, in the very next step, it's going to be randomized. As in, totally random. So, it are, so whatever we prepare, the state in doesn't really matter. Yeah. Because the next step is going to randomize it. Right. It's, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like the it's like the wave packet rule. Yeah. Except it, 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 it except it goes out uh, really fast. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is it's, it is a bit up. Yeah. It is. Except it goes in one go. Um, yeah. The, the probability of staying in this state. Even one step is one of is um, is like uh, one over two to the n for one time step. Next time step, another it's one over two to the n, yeah. and for t time steps, it's that time that times that is one over two to the n to the power of t. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen that the system is going to stay in that in that state. And. Do you say that the time step is, is like another ensemble, or how do you define a time step? Oh, it's, it's the, it's the, uh, um, 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 I don't know, in this, in this case I'm, I'm, I'm looking at um, one particular member of the ensemble, and I'm, and I'm just um, asking, oh, what's the probability that it's going to be in the same 
um, state in the next time step. A time step, I just mean just discretize time. Maybe take a snapshot now, um, initially, and then uh, some some time later, which is greater than its relaxation time. You know, let everything settle down, the spins settle down, and stuff. Yeah. So ensembles, the ensemble evolves so that the probability of occupation spreads out from the original delta function and more and more states are occupied. It's, it's, it's simply the law of chance. You know, it's like, it's extremely unlikely that, that the state will, that the system will remain, that the ensemble will remain localized. If the, if the probability is, uh, if, if it's not one, zero, but let's say there, and then zero there, a little bit there, a bit more there, a little bit there, more there, zero, zero, zero. It's extremely unlikely that those states there are going to remain empty. Yeah. Extremely unlikely. Okay. Yeah. So, so systems uh, will tend to, uh, and 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 this this these states here are completely accessible to to this energetically accessible. Well, you know, in this case, it's just coin tossing. So, of course, they're accessible. There's nothing stopping the coins from from flipping, and so that to, to prevent them from going into the, this state. So, the, this death is it's, it's just by the law of chance that the, the, the number of occupied states is going to um, increase. To be and eventually, you guess the um, like. All of these states get, you know, bit by bit, get slightly occupied, or maybe even extremely occupied, um, uh, equally occupied after one or two steps. Um, and none of the other states, whatever well, other states could be, with just a two-state system, can be occupied. Um, so all the accessible states become equally occupied, and the inaccessible states are not occupied. Inaccessible states meaning uh, maybe I don't know, coin lands on its side or something. In, and this is infinite thin, thinness or something, thickness. So that's the intuition. Now a little bit of quant quant quantitative, something quantitative, and um, this is uh, extremely interesting. Um, it's essentially, uh, it's actually from um, Rife uh, Appendix 12. So let's talk about uh, transition probabilities. So at any time step, uh, you have n coins tossed in every system in the ensemble. If a system is now in state R, what is the probability that in the next instant it will be in state S? Well, there are two of the n states accessible from R uh, in one time step, right? Obviously. Um, S is one of those time steps, one of those states. Therefore, the transition probability is 1 over 2 to the n. Yeah? Seems reasonable. So, what we would say is WRS equals 1 and 2 to the n. Right. And by symmetry, because this system is um, isotropic and there's no favored directions. WSR equals 1 over 2 to the n. So, so for this coin tossing system, uh, we have shown that WRS equals WSR, which is the principle of detailed balance in terms of transition probabilities. Okay. Now, Boltzmann's H theorem. Um, suppose an isolated system obeys the principle of detailed balance, which is this here. The probability PR of finding the system in state R increases with time because some systems have moved into state R. Okay. And decreases with time because some systems have left state R. Okay. So the rate of change of the probability of being in state R is uh, 1 over the number of systems in the ensemble times the number of systems in state S times the probability of transition away from S 
uh, from S into sorry from S into R. Now S, what this is, um, so there is a target state R. This is the number of states that are going into R. So S is that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. You're summing over all the probabilities around here of going into R. Okay. And then minus the number of the, uh, the total probability of states leaving R, yeah. which is the number of systems in state R, multiplied by the probability of transition from R to S. Okay. And then you sum over all um, states where all, all states that are accessible from R. Okay. So, that's, that's this here. So it's sum over S, P, S, W, S, R, minus sum over S, P, R, W, R, S. This is like the excess of states entering R. That's the rate of change of probability of uh, being in R. Which seems reasonable, right? Okay. Then using principle of detailed balance, you just swap this one around. That's WRS there. And so now you factorize WRS and you got PS minus PR there. Um, now we'll quant define a quantity called H. Uh, I don't know, uh, I'm not sure why, what, what bolts are meant by H. He's German, so um, H it would have some, um, um, it would be some, the first letter of some German word. Average of the log of PR over all R. So H is the average of the log of the probabilities. LNPR average. Uh, which is uh, sum over R, PR, LNPR. Okay. And then if you differentiate dH by dT, okay, dH by dT. equals um, sum over R dPr by dT LNPR plus sum over R PR d by dT of this which is um, PR dot which is um, dPr by dT yeah which is up there Sorry? Which is up there. DPR by DT times 1 on PR. That's, that's that. So that's, that cancels. Also, how do we go from the average of LN PR to the summation? This one? Yeah. Like from the what, what's the definition of average? So, isn't it just the sum of LN PR divided by the triple? Um, because it seems like it's more like an expectation. This one? No, no. Average. The average. Average is average of. This is a random. Ver this is. This is not a random. Ver this is um, the average of that. Is, um, is, the value times the probability of the value. Okay. Okay. Right. 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 Um. Look, actually, what I'll do is I'll let you work out dH by dt, but then you just put in dPr by dt in there. Okay. So then you got sum over minus, sum over R, sum over S, WRS, PR minus PS, this. Then, now you do exactly the same thing, but focus on state S. All of this, focus was on state R, you repeat this with focus on state S. If you focus on state S, then you got to sum over all of R, sum over S times this. And that's, and that's also using the principle of detail balance. In fact, uh, this one was using the principle of detail balance. Right. And then you just add that to that. 
So you get 2 dh by dt, and there's this double sum, wrs pr minus ps, there. ln ps plus 1, minus, oh, in fact, um, it's, it's, it's that. It's just copy, that's just exact, I mean, just copy that. But then if you swap, um, ps plus 1, in fact, um, the ones cancel out. Yeah, the one, the, basically the ones cancel out here because yeah, and you've got PR WRS PR minus PS ln PS minus ln PR. Okay, that's just that minus sign. Okay, and then we put want to put a minus sign out there and have PR minus PS times ln PR minus ln PS. And the reason we do that is the following. And you look at this, this is the rate of change of the average of the log of the probability as the system is evolving. It's evolving in, you know, wherever it wants to go. And we want to find out what the time average, what, what the time derivative of dh by dt is, how it changes with time. Now, there are three cases. Either PR is greater than PS. But this one was dh for r and this one was dh for s. You, you, you get up to here for r, yeah. you do exactly the same thing for s. Um, yeah, it is, and, 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 and the thing is that um, using the, the, the these, um, this has been swapped around, with the hence the minus sign there. Oh. Yeah. So, so that, see, the, these are the same, PR, PR, PS, PS, but they've been swapped, these ones have been swapped around, it, should, it would be normally PS here. Oh, so really you, you can check it up. It's the same one for PS. Yes, this is exactly the same thing, but for PS, right, but in that, but you have, must have a minus sign in one of them. You, you, you'll see it, it's, it's right. Alright, but now this point here. This gives us the H by dt in terms of this. PR minus PS. What if PR is bigger than PS? Well, if PR is bigger than PS and the log of PR is bigger than the log of PS. Um, that means, so PR minus PS times log of PR minus log of PS, you got positive times positive, so you got positive. What if PR is less than PS? Well, log of PR is less than log of PS. PR minus P. And this product now is negative times negative, which is positive. What if PR equals PS? Then here it's all zero. So that means that dH by dt is either zero, or oh, hey, this is a negative sign there, is either zero or positive. Is it related to anything? So dH by dt is, oh sorry, zero or negative? Yeah, 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 negative, yeah. So it's positive, it's either positive or zero, so that's negative or zero. So dH by dt is less than equal to zero. In particular, uh, dH, by, dH by dt is zero if and only if the probability is PR equals PS for all states R and S. So this, this quantity H stops changing only if all the probabilities for, for the states are the same. Uh, but that means that the probability is constant, constant for all states. And that's Boltzmann's H theorem. H, theorem. H this H. Um, I, I keep meaning to look up what H stands for in German, but maybe someone can do it in email. Okay. So, so, and when they stop changing, um, that's when, that's equilibrium. You've got, um, you've got the detailed balance happening in equilibrium.
Okay. Oh, okay, you've got equilibrium happen. All right. Um, also, the corollary, in equilibrium, the quantity, they'll put a minus sign there, minus the sum of RPR and NPR, in other words, minus the average of LNPR, right, is maximized. You see, if it's zero, the H is minimized. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's la 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 la. H is decreasing, 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 and then then the slope is zero. Yeah. So and minus it just stays there. And minus that, it's increasing, 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 and it's like that. So minus the average of log PR is maximized in equilibrium. So what has gone into that result? It's this idea of, first of all, that that it, it, that this kind of isotropy. There's no favored. There are no favored states. There's no. Um, the, the system does not pile up in any particular state because it, because the, the 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 tendencies to move out of any state as much as to move into it at any time step. There's no piling up. And I don't know how he got how he got this insight, but he thought of this number. And he called it H, and he got this. And this is um, many years before Shannon and information theory. You might you might have seen that there before. Some of you don't know. Okay. Okay. Uh, call the number of systems represented in the equilibrium ensemble, or number of accessible states, omega. Um, so omega is two to the n for coin tosses. Um, okay. Uh, if the at in equilibrium, it's just PR is just one over omega in that case. If you substitute into H in equilibrium, PR is one over omega. So H is this here, and your sum is from one to omega. So that's one over omega log of one over omega. But one over omega is a constant. So put it out. So it's minus one over omega log of omega times sum of r equals one to omega of one. And that's, that there is just omega. Omega cancels, so it's minus log of omega. So in other words, log of omega equals minus the sum of r pr ln pr. Okay. Log of omega is what we've been calling the entropy, dimensionless entropy. So this thing here is what's for an isolated system in equilibrium. Um, it certainly looks like log of omega. It certainly looks like n-dimensionless entropy. Okay. Um, suppose we let an isolated system come to equilibrium. This means that any state is as likely as any other. And so we have a certain omega. You now increase the size of the isolated system. Um, for example, how do you increase the size of the isolated system? So for example, you hold down half the coins so they can't move there. So you hold down half, so they can't move, then you hold down a third. So you're holding down fewer and fewer coins. How does omega change? Well, dh by dt from up there is minus 1 over omega d omega by dt, and it's got to be less than or equal to 0. So minus dh by dt is that, it must be positive, or 0. So d omega by dt is greater than or equal to 0. So d log of omega by dt is greater than or equal to zero. So what we've 
got is a sequence of isolated systems of increasing number of accessible states. So what that's saying is that meaning, here we go, if you allow, we allow an isolated system to come to equilibrium, if we remove a constraint, in the instant after this, it is a non-equilibrium state, which means the ensemble is highly overrepresented uh, by, by one particular kind of subset of states, in which omega is relatively small, but the law of probabilities means that that can't stay the situation, that, that situation can't hold. This new isolated system reaches equilibrium and omega is larger than before. So that means the isolated system evolves so that more and more states are occupied and they are occupied in equal proportion. So the idea is that you have, for example, to think of an um, um, Let's think of an isolated system and a partition and it's got an ideal gas there. Its accessible states um, occupy only this volume. You take it away, take that away in the, in the first instant. This in phase space, this is highly, over, over, this, this um, part of phase space um, which corresponds to this volume is highly overrepresented, over and it can't, um, and it, this can't hold because just the probability of it holding is too is extremely small. It must move into the other accessible states, and eventually, by the H theorem, it's got to um, reach a situation where the all all the accessible states are equal, equally likely. Okay, so um, okay, let's have a ten minute break. Then. It's really useful uh, um, in. Well, I've read quite a few papers, especially in chemical physics, where this technique is used to develop models or theories of statistical mechanics, and it's, it's really worth knowing. It's very interesting too. So the basic idea is, uh, suppose that you have an ensemble, the, 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 the ensemble one um, occupations, occupation numbers, um, two, three. So this one is n zero zero. So n one, n two, n three. So in this ensemble. Um, all the systems are in state 1 and 0, 0. In this ensemble, let's say um, n on 2 are here, n on 3 are here, n on 6, thanks. n on 6 are there. That's another distribution. Okay. But I don't mean a distribution, I mean that there's a distribution of systems in the state, these states. Is, is that is that okay? Is that clear? This one, let's say, is n on three, n on three, n on three. Okay. This is okay, this is one ensemble. Sorry, right? each that corresponds to one ensemble, oh. and so um, there, there is a, there is a huge number of systems, and each system can only have three states. Um, and I counted each member of the ensemble. I counted. I, I, I took a snapshot and counted and counted the number of states that are that are present in each ensemble in, in, in this ensemble. And that's the all n zero zero. No, this is this is not. This is this is these are separate ensembles. Yes. Okay. And we're just looking at different distributions at the same time. Okay. We're just seeing what difference would it make if this ensemble. Say if if one ensemble has this distribution, this ensemble has this distribution, this ensemble has this distribution. Okay, so, but what I mean by distribution, this is it means something like this, okay? And 
and just be just to make sure that so here I've got a lot of systems, many systems, and and they've got um, n particles, but they can only be in three states. And I, and I counted them. Uh, one in there, uh, that one is there. That one is. Hey, this one, okay, I don't want to talk anymore. Yeah, sure. okay. Each Got system it? can be in three Each, yeah. Each, uh, each, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that's what I mean by distribution. Okay. So, so given an ensemble of copies of a system prepared according to some macroscopic conditions, you know, say total energy. So oscillates and total energy is known to within some small range. What distribution of occupation numbers, so what set of distribution numbers here, of systems, um, which distribution is the most likely, which distribution of systems among the accessible state is most likely? Most likely. Okay. So, which distribution here, which of these distributions is the most likely? Mm -hmm. The last. Mm -hmm. Or all of them equally likely. Mm -hmm. each, each particular like, um, like configuration is equally likely. We'll see. So, um, so, let this gamma here be the number, and it's a function of the occupation numbers, okay, so the occupation of each state, be the number of ways of selecting this large curly n number of systems such that n1 are in state 1, n2 are in state 2. So what that is, this gamma is just the total number of ways of uh, permutations of n1, n1 plus n2 plus n3 all the way up to all the states, okay. But you're overcounting because uh, you've overcounted um, the number of systems in just state number one. So you divide by one factorial. Overcounted these these you know, any system in state number two, um, you've overcounted here. So you divide by that. Try to understand the starting point. Is this okay? Yeah. Okay. They take the log of that and so suppose that um, you can use the fake, the not real, the not exact, not, not precise sterling approximation without the two pi, without the pi. So it's nr over nr minus nr, it's log over nr. And so you, you just substitute that in. Oh, actually, it's, it's this here in the box. nr factorial is nr to the nr e to the minus nr. And so what you get is that you've got that there is curly n to the n e to the minus n, n1 to the n1, e to the minus n1, etc. in the denominator. But these exponentials, you can just add up what's in the exponent of the exponentials. These exponentials, these exponents, n1 plus n2 plus n3, the sum of all the occupations equals the number of systems in the ensemble. So you've got e to the minus curly n in the denominator. So that cancels with that one. So you've just got curly n to the n times these n1 to the n1, etc. Plus small terms. Okay. And then, and so that's gamma. And so the log of that, it, now it's easy to take the log, you see. Zoom. Zoom, okay. Zoom out. Right now it's easy to take the log. And so I take the log of a curly n log n minus 
those N1, log N1, etc. <coughs> plus small terms, Jobby and Dory. But that's. But. But, 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 but it's just the N is the sum of the. Oh, yes. That N is the sum of all the little N's. This bit here. Um, and so this is this has a term like n one log of curly n log of n minus n one ln n one and there's all the others. So that's n one log of curly n. Minus log of n one. That's what that line is. Uh, except I've got minus n one ln n one minus ln curly n like that, and then you've got all the others. You see that step? Very simple. That's ln n one over curly n. Do you see something emerging? What do you see emerging? What's this here? That's a probability of being in state one. You see, it's emerging out of the out of the equation, out of the maths. And if you divide both sides by um, curly n, then the right hand side you just got this this, this p1 ln p1 plus p2 ln p2 etc., which is minus the sum of our p i ln p i. So to maximize, to, to, to find the maximum number of um, permutations, or to find the most probable um, distribution, you've got to maximize this thing here, which is minus h. And it's also the entropy. You've got to maximize the entropy to find the distribution that is the most probable there. Um, let n tends to infinity. There are these small terms that were here. That's one over n there. See, these small terms um, uh, become insignificant. So that's so that's that. In other words, we want to find the probability distribution PR that maximizes this subject to. The constraint sum of R of n little n R equals capital N. That's that. It's a good number of systems in the ensemble, but then divide both sides by curly n. And here you've got the sum of the probabilities equal to one. Okay. So you wanna you wanna the problem is to maximize this function. It's a function of the PRs, subject to that constraint. And, of course, that is the entropy. You've got to maximize the entropy. So now the question is, how do you do constrained optimization problems? Right, so you use the math method of the branch multipliers. I'll explain how it works another day, not now. We'll just learn the recipe. Um, in fact, if you stare at this for long enough, it's you, you'll 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 realise that it's completely obvious in this particular simple case. But I'm not going to do it by inspection. I'm going to tell you the method of Lagrange multipliers because it's really important. This is one of the skills you need to know, I think, um, in undergraduate physics. So, suppose that you want to you want to maximise or minimize some function f of any number of variables subject to a condition g as a function of those variables equals zero. So the first step is write down another function f hat, which is f minus lambda g. The lambda is called the Lagrange multiplier. So f is your what's called the objective function we're trying to optimize. 
and g is the constraint. So it's f minus lambda g. And then you calculate the gradient of the function f hat, and you set it equal to zero, and this gives the optimal point x max or x min, where which which uh, maximizes or minimizes your objective function. Okay. And the Lagrange, and it also gives you the Lagrange multiplier lambda. Um, right now, I'll just show you the recipe. This is the recipe, and another day um, I will show you why it works. So the method of Lagrange multiplies. Um, so in this case, what function are we trying to minimize? Um, well, uh, yes, in fact, this is h. Uh, I don't think many people know it here would, would know what h means, so it's probably best to call this minus entropy. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it, you're actually maximizing the entropy. But we're minimizing minus that, okay, so just because I feel like minimizing rather than maximizing today. So if f is, is, and your variables are p1 up to p, um, that's a big r for some reason, okay. And that's the function. And the constraint, you've got to write a constraint such that this function equals zero. So the constraint that we had was the sum of the probabilities equals one. So you've got to write sum of the probabilities minus one equals zero. And that's your function g of r, g of p, all of all the p's. Okay. Now take the grade, oh, and, then, and so your, um, your, your function f hat, including the Lagrange multiplier, is your objective function minus lambda times the constraint function. Okay. And now you take the gradient. Now the gradient in this case means d by dp1, the vector d by dp1 of vector notation, d by dp1 up to d by d by dp r acting on f hat. Okay. Now, what do you think is going to happen here? Do you think? <coughs> uh, have a look at this. And what do you think is going to happen? What What is the simplification? Why is it that this is extremely simple? Because it, there's no cross. There are no cross terms. Yes. K equation or Right. So, so you've just got separate uh, each separate term of that sum and each separate term of that sum uh, only contains a single uh, uh, variable, if you like. Okay. So this gradient is extremely easy to calculate. So if you consider d by dpk of f hat, just pick out one of them, then that's just d by dpk of sum over r of that minus d by dpk of that plus zero, that last one, d by dpk of that is zero. But only, but these, only one of these sum, only one of the terms in the sum contains pk. So that's d by dpk of pr ln pr. So that's ln, in fact, it's uh, ln pk plus 1. So the product rule, so that's uh, ln pk plus 1 minus, and for the same reason, only, only pk survives here. Uh, but in fact, uh, it's d by dpk of pk, which is 1. So it's lambda times 1, so it's lambda. So it's that minus lambda. And that you set that equal to 0. So each, each of these um, components equal to zero. So that gives you an equation that be, between lambda and, and the pk. So log of pk is lambda minus one. pk is either minus lambda one, minus one. But lambda is a constant. It's the Lagrange multiplier. And so that's a constant. In fact, it's a constant for all k. So this probability is a constant. And you can evaluate that constant by normalizing the by normalization. So that's sum over all the probabilities, and there are there are omega accessible states. So that um, one over one to omega, well, that's supposed to be omega. <laughs> and so that's just c of b equals one. So c equals one over omega. So that means the probability is one over omega for all r. Okay. So you just so what you've done, you've just optimized the number 
of he found that like the most most likely allocation of occupation numbers if you were just if you just randomly uh, assign occupation numbers a huge number of times and then you check which one occurs the most you will find that the one that occurs the most is the one where all the occupations are the same it maximizes that Maximizing that is the same as maximizing the entropy. Now, actually, this point is uh, gets buried in textbooks. You know, they don't mention this point. Only only a few of them do. Maximizing the entropy is the same as maximizing that. Right. So, oh, and just one other point maybe to remember for next time. In this time, we didn't care about uh, figuring out what lambda means thermodynamically because, um, and then the all the same. Because, because they're all the same. Next time, when for a system in contact with a heat reservoir, we're going to figure out what lambda means. So this probability distribution maximizes the log of omega in an isolated system. We can also talk about log of omega. Log of omega, and um, or we can talk about the uh, minus uh, the average of uh, the average of LNPR minus the average of LNPR. Okay. So that's another viewpoint. Next one is entropy and our knowledge or ignorance of a system. So the quantity minus sum of our PR and NPR measures the number of states over which probability is spread. And in fact, as does log of omega. It also measures the flatness of the probability distribution. In fact, that's what we just saw. If the probability distribution is flat, then that number is maximized. And if it's completely peaked on one state, then that number is, in fact, um, as small as possible. So, what, in fact, what does that mean? It's, it's, it's this. This is what I just said. So, you got what this is is that if you have um, all, all systems in your ensemble, in state number k, so there, and none in any other state. That means complete certainty. We know that if we randomly pick a state from that ensemble, from, from the ensemble, we know with 100% certainty that we're going to get state k. So, system is in a definite state. In fact, then it's also highly non-equilibrium state. A high this one, what if it's slightly spread? It's, it's kind of like peaked on one state, but there's a little bit of probability on either side, and you know, it gets exponentially smaller here. So we've got some certainty here, but not complete certainty. This is complete certainty. This is some certainty. It means that the system is most likely to be <clears throat> in this range of states, but not in others. And it means that if we just pick our state at random, we're not, we, we know that, well, we, it's, we, it's going to be in this range, but we don't know exactly where it's going to be. It's certainly not going to be there or there, but <clears throat> it's going to be sort of here somewhere, but <clears throat> we, know, we don't know. It's somewhere in this smaller range. We, we, there, is, there is less certainty because the probability distribution is more spread out than that delta function. Whereas when the probability distribution is flat, that's complete ignorance because we pick our system from the ensemble. We don't know where it's going to be. Well, we don't know if it's this state or that state. We don't know what state it's going to be. And it's equally likely to be in any state. Any feature in the probability distribution any feature, anything that makes it not a flat, 
makes, means it's, uh, there is more certainty here than elsewhere. Any feature. So it completely flat means it's featureless. There's nothing, it's like living in Japan and being part of a team, right? There's absolutely no individuality. <laughs> <laughs> right? Everyone gets the exactly the same amount of recognition. Unless you're the head professor, right? Then it's a dollar function. Right? Okay? So maximizing that there maximizes the flatness of the probability distribution over all the accessible states, and that maximizes our ignorance of the actual state of the system. Uh, you can read this next bit for yourself. It's just information theory as well. Um, it's, it's amazing that the same form minus, basically minus the average of log of the probability appears in, uh, well, it appeared in Boltzmann's um, theory first, and then Shannon um, just rediscovered it. I'm uh, not sure when he was living. I think it was like early 1900s. And uh, von Neumann entropy for quantum mechanics and information. Um, many different kinds of entropies. Kolmogorov entropy for um, other things. Many different kinds of entropy can be defined like this. But it starts off with, started off with Boltzmann, where you had, say, particles in a system. And if you remove a constraint, then the particles can flow into more degrees of freedom. So the particles can flow in more degrees of freedom, so it increases the entropy, makes the probability distribution flatter. And for this reason, I say that the principle of um, increasing entropy in spontaneous processes is really energy flowing into degrees of freedom that have been made available. So entropy is the spread of energy into newly available degrees of freedom. And once they flow into those accessible, newly available degrees of freedom, the, the energy can't get back without help. So that's why entropy always increases in spontaneous processes. So entropy is the spread of energy, in, 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 a, like in a nutshell, you know, putting it in that way. You can read that. This is the same as before. Um, logic of the theory, microeconomical ensemble is what we've been talking about. You can read that for yourself. This is um, quantum statistical mechanics. Um, we, we can't talk about this yet. I'm just putting this here just to, uh, just to show you that it's a little bit different. There's one more thing that you have to talk about in quantum statistical mechanics, that's called the, um, you don't only need the, uh, that all accessible states have equal a priori probability, uh, but they also have random phases, that's something else. Um, entropy, uh, S on K is basically minus H, which is that, and so S equals K and omega, blah, 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 we've done all that before, we've done all this before, so don't have to worry about that. Finally, uh, the connection with thermodynamics, and we're nearly finished. So this is, this is, we've just built up um, statistical, statistical mechanics, kind of uh, an understanding of entropy, but we still haven't proven that, uh, that this is really connected to thermodynamics, that, that the entropy defined in statistical mechanics is the same as the entropy defined in thermodynamics. We haven't proved it yet. Uh, it seems to have the same sort of properties, but does it really? Okay. So what you've got to do is get the, uh, equations from statistical mechanics or the definition of entropy and show that the in equilibrium uh, between two subsystems you get the same equilibrium conditions as you would in thermodynamics so it predicts the same equilibrium conditions right? and once that happens you can say okay we have um, maybe even derived something about thermodynamics from a, from a more maybe fundamental theory from, from a microscopic view okay so 
<coughs> so, um, so the conditions for equilibrium. <coughs> so it seems that the condition for statistical equilibrium is given by the most probable condition of an isolated system. Um, therefore, it seems that the entropy is a maximum when an isolated system is in equilibrium. Right. Um, so suppose you've got a, uh, an isolated system that's partitioned into two, um, like that, and we've got the dimensionless entropy sigma, it's just log of omega. Um, and and um, 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 so the total entropy of the isolated system is the sum of the entropies of the individual subsystems. Uh, let's let the partition be diathermal and rigid and impermeable. Um, so it, it allows heat through, um, but not but no particles and it can't move. So by the entropy maximum principle, which we've derived in several ways now, okay, several ways, the total entropy must be maximum with respect to small transfers of energy. Okay. So if you transfer a little bit of energy across that, that boundary, um, it means that uh, you, you, um, um, the, 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 the change in entropy must be zero if, if, the, if the amount of energy is smaller. So delta sigma uh, is d sigma by du uh, across the Vnn times delta u. Um, this delta means that uh, that means that um, this thing must be small enough <coughs> so that the first term of a Taylor expansion for sigma um, is enough. Right? So really, so this delta is a, is a is a like a concrete small amount. It's not a limit as something tends to zero. Um, and anyway, so then. So then um, delta sigma equals delta sigma 1 plus delta sigma 2 from there. But that has to equal 0 at the entropy maximum, when entropy is maximum. So the delta sigma is, is, um, is this because, it's a, uh, because that one is a function of u1 and that was a function of u2. And since total energy is conserved, we have delta u equals delta u1 plus delta u2 equals 0. It's all, it all, it's all looking very familiar, right? But remember, uh, we haven't formally shown that this sigma is the same as a the thermodynamics uh, entropy. It, all the equations are having the same form, okay? Um, and so delta sigma is, is delta sigma one equals that, right? That's for arbitrary delta u. <coughs> um, that means that we must have an equality between that means this coefficient must equal zero. So that means that delta sigma 1 over delta u1 equals delta sigma 2 over delta u2. Define a quantity tau. This is, a, this is supposed to be tau. Sometimes I write tau like that. Sometimes I write it like that. I want to write it like that, but people complain that it looks like an R. <laughs> so so um, this is a tau, not an R. R has got like a, a sharp corner there, like a non-differentiable bit there. Right? So define tau by one over tau equals d sigma by du. Then thermal equilibrium, the thermal equilibrium condition there is just tau one equals tau two. Right? Now tau has dimensions of energy because um, that is dimensionless and this is energy. Okay. So what does this condition mean? Um, it's the reciprocal of delta u one over delta by du, but du1 by d sigma 1, uh, sorry, it's d, du1, uh, du1 by d sigma 1 equals du2 d sigma 2. Uh, this is saying that the number of accessible states of subsystem 1 or 2 is increased by a small amount. If the number of accessible states is increased, if you increase the amount of accessible states there, then the amount of energy that flows into um, those accessible states here is equal to the same thing um, here. If I increase this one by some amount, then the amount of energy flowing into those accessible states, um, um, the ratio is the same. Okay? So you can see you've got this completely different picture now. Energy flowing into accessible states. Right? Because that's what entropy is. Right? 
uh, and, and I mean concretely, I wouldn't use this partial D, I would use the, the concrete little delta U1, see? That, that's what I really mean, amount of energy flowing. <coughs> Um, so the thermal equilibrium is that. Tau has this familiar property, um, as, I, as I've done before, I don't want to go through this again. If, um, if, uh, if delta sigma is positive, then, um, wait, 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 wait. If, if tau, tau 2 is better than tau 1, then, um, then, uh, then the energy of system 1 increases, which means that heat flows from the second system into the first system. That's that. Um, so tau behaves like the temperature. Yeah, obviously the other way around as well. So the, the tau behaves like the temperature, um, or it, 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 more precisely, it's a monotonically increasing function of temperature. So tau tau is um, is um, somehow um, I wouldn't say proportional to, but is is some equals some function of some function of the absolute temperature. Such that it increases. Yeah, yeah such, such that it's uh, monotonically increasing. Yeah. Uh, mechanical equilibrium, blah, 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 same as last time, except that I don't want to uh, assume that, um, that anything here is the pressure. So instead of P, I'll put pi and just say, just say that, okay. But oh, yeah. uh, how, do, how do we know that it's monotonically increasing as a function of temperature? Because if it wasn't, um, um, because we know from thermodynamics that T2 is greater than T1 implies delta U1 is greater than zero. Uh, and, and we've just seen that tau one is grad, tau two is greater than tau one implies delta E1 is greater than zero. Um, and um, so if we sub the T2 into that one, this T tau two of T2 must be greater than tau one of T1. Okay, thanks. Uh, it's just it's a little little detail. Uh, if we sub in T2 and T1 into the second one, which one? Uh, into the tau's. But we don't have a relation between T and tau. Yeah, but assume that T tau is a function of T. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. Then, then it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, blah, blah, blah. Pi, you got pi on tau equals d sigma by dv. So mechanical equilibrium gives you pi 1 equals pi 2. And um, it has all the it has all the um, um, properties of pressure, basically. So you say, oh, okay, that's the pressure. Yeah. If it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Right, that's what it's saying. Particle equilibrium, etc. Same thing as before. Mu, uh, you know, what's another symbol besides mu? Whatever. Okay, you get. Um, you get the equality of um, um, chemical potential. So the connection between statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. Um, just finally finish off. The, en the dimensionless entropy is a function of U. Um, this X sub nu and this Ni. The U is internal energy in thermodynamics or E bar in statistical mechanics. U is the typical um, letter used in thermodynamics and but E bar is what it means in, from the microscopic view. Um, these X sub nu, this is like nu, um, that's the external parameters like volume. In this case it's going to be um, extensive because within the entropy representation. And Ni is a number of modes or particles um, of species I. And then go d sigma as usual, d sigma by du, blah, 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 blah. And that's one on tau, that's, um, that's gonna be one on tau. And this is gonna be capital X sub nu, this derivative is gonna be capital X sub nu. 
there's a one on tau there, and that derivative, uh, the chem that's going to be the chemical potentials. And so du is tau, uh, oh, oh, du for turn it around is tau d sigma minus uh, this capital X nu. So obviously this capital X corresponds to the intensive parameter, the intensive parameters before, uh, and that's just the same as before. Um, and then it's very easy to show that, uh, that uh, for example, if uh, x nu is the volume, then you just recolor um, the, um, um, oh, oh this, this shows that this du is a sum of two parts, uh, change the internal energy, um, when x, when, if, if, though, if that's kept constant, then it's just that, so it's like a heat, um, it's what happens when, um, it's what we call heat. If you have no mechanical um, changes, uh, and, but increasing energy, that's what we call heat. Um, that, and so that means that dq, this is just very formal, so dq tau d sigma implies d sigma equals one on tau d, dq. Second law of thermodynamics in thermodynamics is dq is tds. So that means that um, tau is exactly the temperature. Before we said the tau is monotonically increasing function of temperature, now we're saying that it's exactly the temperature. That comes from this step here, the second law. Um, similarly, um, yeah, yeah, pi is a pi is pressure, um, it's easy to find. Um, but also, um, both one on tau and one on t are integrating factors for the inexact differential d sig dq um, to give the exact differential ds. Um, uh, there's a theorem of Caratheodori regarding what's called Fafian. Fafian is an amusing Fafian forms. Don't worry about that. This is what du is. Just what it's just what um, that is a Fafian form. It's a linear relation, linear combination of differentials. That um, um, they can only differ by at most a multiplicative constant. Therefore, we define tau. Oh, sorry, not exactly t at all. Sorry, tau is k times t, uh, where k has dimensions of energy per unit kelvin, because that's dimensionless and that's energy per unit kelvin times kelvin. So that's energy. So one on tau is that. Um, d sigma by d u, one on k t is that, so one on t equals d k sigma by d u, which means that k sigma, which we define can define as s, would then be k ln omega. So that's working sort of the other way around from uh, to get together to get the equations from around the back. Okay, and k b is established from experiment to be Boltzmann's constant. The reason why Boltzmann's constant is so small is that uh, basically um, human life evolved to be very large compared to molecules. <laughs> if we were like molecules, then um, um, this problem, if, if yeah, this, this would be probably quite large. If, if molecules were like the size of billiard balls, then um, life would be rather different. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but then Boltzmann's constant would be about the size of like one or ten or something. Um, okay, and um, and so last lastly, um, um, using the microcanonical ensemble, this is going to be an assignment question anyway later on. Using the microcanonical ensemble, calculate the entropy of a monatomic ideal gas. Mono, monatomic, mono, monotonic, <laughs> monatomic. The ideal gas in three dimensions. What is wrong with it? How does the phase space volume need to be rewritten uh, to give the correct expression? So the volume in phase space is just the integral um, of the accessible region of phase over the accessible region of phase space. So it's an integral over with six n coordinates, and it's um, um, in between the energy, um, which gives the range of the q's and p's. In fact, it's just the range of the p's. Um, is is some within some um, narrow band, and that, and um, and so just you just sort of calculate this integral. Uh, you'll there's an assignment question that sort of walks you through it a little bit coming up. 